Spec Ops The Line is a great game. It came out years and years ago, so you probably already know that and have probably either seen a Let's Play or played it yourself, and if you haven't and didn't know it was great, surprise. I knew it as a critical darling that was being raved about back in 2012, and it definitely deserved every bit of praise that it got, and then some. To me, what I consider to be the greatest games are the ones that inspire you. Inspire you to discuss them, inspire you to analyze them, inspire you to play through it again in order to pick up on what you missed. Even inspire you to go on impassioned sermons completely off the top of your head to whoever will listen to you. For the record, the guy at the Walmart checkout didn't care. Contrarily, the worst games, or at least the worst ones to talk about, are the ones that evoke no strong emotion whatsoever. The games that are white noise of the mind. And few games have really piqued my imagination or my desire to talk at length about them like Spec Ops The Line has, and amazingly, it did it without ever having to be attached to a larger brand. I mean, it is part of a larger brand, but one that had been dormant for a decade and was a series of B-tier shooters that had continued to be released on the PS1 even after the PS2 was out. So that tells you all you need to know. But back to Spec Ops The Line. I played it recently for the first time, and within a six-hour campaign, I was practically feeling ill over how this game managed to grip me and also punch me in the nuts, so to speak. And it's hard to think of another game that took me from a 0 to a 100 quite like this game did. It's given me a lot to think about and a lot to talk about. Now, Spec Ops The Line, from what I understand, was inspired by Heart of Darkness, something I'm not at all familiar with, but that's because I'm fairly uncultured when it comes to books. However, to what degree it takes inspiration from Heart of Darkness, I have no idea. Fans of the book can sound off in the comment section. All I know is, it, as well as the movie it inspired, Apocalypse Now, are both considered absolute masterpieces, so suffice it to say, this is a game that had big shoes to fill and a bit of a reputation. It didn't receive exponential praise for its gameplay, but the story was considered one of the greats, utilizing its framing device as a third-person generic contemporary warfare game to mask a dark underbelly of disturbing subject matter and horrifying imagery. And if you like psychological thrillers with creepy imagery that makes you question reality, check it out, cause I'm about to spoil it. It wasn't really grabbing me at first because, like I said, it starts out as a straight-faced military shooter, something I'm not really into and have never really been into. I tried playing Call of Duty back in the day and spent most of my time questioning what all the fuss was about. On an objective level, this game plays just fine. It's a linear cover-based shooter where you move from environment to environment shooting anything that moves. It's something that you've seen a million times and there's nothing I can really add to the discussion. I guess you die a little bit easily, and there are a few bottlenecks, but it never got so bad that it got frustrating. Otherwise, it's exactly what you would expect a third-person military shooter to be. But it needed to present itself as a run-of-the-mill shooter in order to make the events of the game hit harder. Because to deconstruct tropes, you first need to establish what those tropes are. As a matter of fact, despite where this game will take Captain Walker's psyche, he doesn't really sweat the idea of killing his fellow man at the beginning of the game. Much like any hero in any military shooter, killing them their bad guys is just another day at the office. Which I suppose is what he signed up for. The entire premise of the game starts out with a Delta Force team comprised of Captain Walker and his men, Lugo and Adams, attempting to evacuate a ruined Dubai, but they're faced with the 33rd Brigade of the US military, which in the time since Dubai was demolished have all gone rogue. It's worth noting at this point that there's a lot of dialogue to set up and foreshadow future events that you're not even supposed to think twice at. And we're 800 yards away from seeing who's more full of sh You or Intel. Wow. If I wasn't a hard and killing machine, I might have hurt. But the most important one is in fact one of the first things that Walker says in the game, is that their orders are to get in, search for survivors, and then leave so they can get past the storm wall and radio command for an evac to the city. Locate survivors, leave the city immediately. Radio command from outside the storm wall. You send in the cavalry, you go home. But as soon as hostiles show themselves, they stay and fight. The truth, Walker, is that you're here because you wanted to feel like something you are not. Hero. Things are going along swimmingly, merrily blowing various armed soldiers to Kingdom Come. Then some ways into the game, the team finds themselves in a populated area that would be hard to push past, so just as a means to push past without risking their own lives, Walker uses white phosphorus on who he thinks are rogue military personnel, but accidentally uses it on a bunch of innocent civilians. 
killing them all horribly. And from there, things change. When Walker uses the white phosphorus, it's deliberately painted as the moment when you're supposed to disconnect with Walker as a character. Because it's the moment that's supposed to break him, causing a slow descent into insanity, creating a deliberate disconnect between the player and player character as Walker's reality starts to break down. You're supposed to feel horrible for this while Walker tries to justify it with his own meek justifications. Things are seemingly going along as they did beforehand, just with Walker being more unhinged and more determined to complete the mission. But things just don't feel right. You start to see things. You even start to infer things based on context and what makes sense, such as Walker picking up a random walkie-talkie and suddenly finding himself in direct contact with the colonel running the 33rd, Colonel Conrad. We the player start to question the decisions and the psyche of the person we're playing as. And there are so many great details in this game that really showcases Walker's descent. His executions against army personnel start to become more and more brutal as the game goes on, his appearance starts to become more and more disheveled, and every time you go back to the main menu, the dead soldier and the flag are in worse and worse shape, mirroring Walker's psyche as well as the state of Dubai itself as he destroys more and more of the city. Even the tactical elements of the game start to fall by the wayside. You have your support characters that you can command in battle, one that specializes in explosives and another that specializes in long-ranged combat. But Lugo, the explosives expert, dies a ways into the game, meaning that the tactical elements start to be taken away as the game goes on, putting the entire burden of this war and the guilt you feel on you and only you. The control and the fun is wrestled away from you as you continue to descend every layer of hell that you found yourself in, gradually being railroaded into a single central point that you're mindlessly, desperately seeking out, the tallest building in Dubai. Your other support character also goes MIA, but by that point, you're almost finished the game, so it doesn't really matter to the gameplay. But Lugo is the interesting one that fundamentally alters the gameplay. So the overall game changes as you do. The part that really got to me though, were the loading screen tips. Naturally, just like any other game of this ilk, if you die, you get tips in the loading screen telling you all the wild and wonderful ways you can stop being so crap, and it also gives you background details on Walker and various people in the game. But as the game goes on, the tips start to become a little bit interesting, and I almost jumped out of my seat when I got this one. This isn't the first time a game more or less broke the fourth wall to communicate something to the player, there's even one specific example that I will save for later, but when it's done right, it always sets off every single one of my mental everything is wrong alarms and this is no different, because it's the game shifting and molding in order to match the psyche of the main character as you commit more and more atrocities. And I only got a handful of these loading screen messages. I've read through a list of all the messages you can get and the progression of which you get them. And I got chills just reading them. But this message is the one that sticks out to me the most. The US military does not condone the killing of unarmed combatants. But this isn't real. So why should you care? It really helps bring across the message that this game is trying to convey. It creates this wonderful meta-narrative by which I'm not even sure who the game is talking to. Are they referring to Walker trying to convince himself that none of this is real and none of this is his fault because he's mad as a house rat? Or are they referring to me, the player, telling me that you're so desensitized to violence as play because of how many games that have come out that treat violence as a fun pastime while glorifying the military at war that you can't even begin to imagine the true horrors of war if any of this were real? And given the time period that Spec Ops The Line came out, I think this is a game that needed to be made, that needed to convey this message. It came out in 2012, which was near enough the absolute height of the military shooter craze in gaming. When the first Modern Warfare came out, it managed to balance being a fun military shooter that people seemed to enjoy, while also showcasing the horrors of war. The nuke scene and the aftermath therein was the peak of this. But following that, military shooters grabbed the wrong end of the wrong stick and started to glorify warfare and the military by becoming increasingly ridiculous and tone-deaf in their depictions. Now, for the record, I believe that anybody brave enough to fight for their own country should be commended. That's an incredibly brave thing to do. However, I also think it's dangerous to glorify depictions of warfare as it might give people the wrong impression that it's fun. I had a few people in high school express their desire to join the military, citing their love of Call of Duty as the reason. So while it wasn't all that popular, you needed a game like this to sort of set the record straight. 
But to me, it being a deconstruction of these modern military shooters is not why I think it's a masterpiece, but more so for what kind of emotion it got out of me. A type of emotion that I don't recall ever getting out of a video game. Once it was all said and done, when I finished the game, I felt like I needed to smoke a joint or go for a walk or do anything to get my mind off of it because this is a game that genuinely got to me and has stuck with me. I'm not the most easily scared person. I mean, I'm not the hardest to scare person, but I can get through most horror games. I can go for a midnight run without feeling scared. I can... Third example. But this is the type of experience that invokes the same feelings of horror that a lot of other games invoke, while also cutting through every level of ego barrier that one has, at least as I see it. Because it's within reason, an entirely plausible experience. It's a game that can almost be described as contemporary realistic horror, and it conveys this atmosphere better than most fictional media because of its plausibility. In a strange way, this game made me question reality itself. Now, this might come as a shock to some of you, but I've never been insane. Though I guess don't count your chickens until they hatch and all that. But from what I understand, being truly mentally shattered isn't too dissimilar from how this game portrays it. If you look into things like post-traumatic stress disorder or psychosis, these are things that can, and to some people, have happened. He sees things that trigger flashbacks that are then pasted over his own reality, and that's why I think it can be described as contemporary horror. The concept of losing your mind is something that I think about from time to time, and it's a genuinely scary thing to imagine. The idea of reality breaking down so that you can no longer tell what's real and what's fake. That's what playing this game had me feeling like. Not necessarily the idea of being insane, because I can't speak on that matter, but the ever-present fear of losing your mind, of reality breaking down, and the inability to discern what's real and what's not. Because that's something I question. If you were experiencing full-tilt, tactile-level hallucination, are you self-aware enough to realize what's real and what's not? Waking up not being able to discern what's real and what's not is a terrifying thought. And there's also the ever-present question of how far can the mind be pushed before you are no longer you anymore. Anybody who's ever experienced a panic attack or severe anxiety probably understands this, that feeling of being in such a state that's so unlike who you are normally, that you either feel like or you fear that you're gonna get to the point of no longer feeling like yourself. At what point did Walker cease to be the person we started out with? That's the question. Dementophobia is a very real thing. The fear of one's own mental state, and the fear of going insane. And that's a fear that I feel that this game genuinely triggers. That fear of insanity. As Walker's mental state declines, I find it harder and harder to discern what's real and what's not in the game. I found myself questioning everything. Obviously it's a game, none of it's real, but from the perspective of the in-game world, what's real? Like I said, it's something that starts off subtle and gradually progresses. It starts off as an armored soldier popping around a room every time the light turns off and back on again, and eventually progresses to the point of full-on tactile world-changing hallucination. It gets inside your head and gives you a tinge of paranoia not knowing what's going to happen next because the rules of reality are constantly being rewritten. You're never quite sure what to expect, to the point that even when Walker's not hallucinating, I don't know if I'm actually fighting people or if he's just imagining various people fighting him. It's a really effective means to psych you out, because if you don't know the rules, then you're not sure what to do at any given moment. This is a high-stress environment that, within the context of the game, is life or death. And if the rules are constantly being rewritten, it's unpleasant, but it's supposed to be. It becomes clearer and clearer that Captain Walker is losing his mind out of the guilt that he's feeling for killing all those innocent civilians. As the game goes on, the imagery we see gets more and more twisted and disturbing, but we the player still aren't aware of the true extent of his mental state until the end of the game when Walker's actions are recontextualized so that we are able to understand the horrors of what we've done from the true perspective rather than from the perspective of a broken man. Beyond all the obvious stuff, you have a bunch of little stuff. People not saying what Walker is hearing, talking to people who weren't there, seeing people alive who were actually dead, and the list goes on. And that, I think, is why the game starts out by telling you that you are the special guest in this game. Incidentally, I forgot to change my Steam name after I played Just Cause 3. Despite being from a third-person perspective, you are viewing this from the perspective of Walker. But in the end, the perspective you see the game from switches to a third-person perspective as we go through all the flashbacks and see the true extent of the horrors that Captain Walker has committed without any filter over it. 
You, the player, are the third-person perspective. You are the special guest. And in the final encounter with Colonel Conrad, it turns out even Conrad's entire involvement in the story was imagined by Walker as a meek attempt to place blame for everything he'd done on someone else. And every single line in this scene hits like a freight train. But as far as my favorite lines, I think it goes to this one. It takes a strong man to deny what's right in front of him. And if the truth is undeniable, you create your own. This entire scenario is haunting in a way that I haven't felt since the first time I played Metal Gear Solid 2 back in high school and the AI started malfunctioning, telling you to turn the game off and all that. It's something that freaked me out back then, and it freaked me out in the exact same way here. Although in my opinion, I think Spec Ops The Line far exceeds what MGS2 was trying to convey, if nothing else because as much as I like narrative in games, I don't like 40 minute non-interactive cutscenes. Spec Ops The Line is something that's going to be sticking with me for a while. I'm going to be thinking about this one for a very long time, all the ways it just messes with you. And the great thing is, none of this would have been possible in any other medium. It wouldn't have been half as effective if we weren't as immersed in the action ourselves and experiencing it firsthand, rather than viewing it as a third party. Like how the helicopter prologue repeats halfway through the game, and sort of breaks the fourth wall in the process. The way it frames the player as an active participant in the story, and that perspective playing into the ending. The way certain story elements are brought across in the gameplay, such as Walker's orders that he barks at his men becoming more unhinged. Keep moving! or his executions becoming more brutal, the loading screen text being a relevant factor in the game's progression, the multiple endings that are dependent on your choices, the way the gameplay shifts in service of the story's progression. It's very deliberately painting itself as a deconstruction of the tropes of military shooters. So it wouldn't have worked if it were translated into a movie or a TV show. Well, at least it wouldn't have the same impact. So with that, how would I describe Spec Ops The Line? Simply, I would describe it as art. Spec Ops The Line is gritty, it's confrontational, it's downright unpleasant, and it's not for the faint of heart. Games these days are a broad enough thing that they can be more than just simply fun things to unwind with. And that's where I think the true artistry of the medium comes out. I know some people scoff at the idea of games being art, and granted, I do think that for much of gaming's infancy, it had more in common with board games than distinguished storytelling mediums like movies or books. Because how can something be art if all you're doing is playing something with a simple rule set and getting points? But I believe as the medium has progressed, gaming has long since been able to be considered art, as it's been able to tell intricate stories and challenging stories in ways that other mediums can't. And Spec Ops The Line is a prime example of this. It's a great game, even though it sometimes scares me and makes me question reality. Maybe I'm overselling it, because yeah, it doesn't hold up solely as a game, and it took a while for me to get into, but once it grabbed me, it didn't let go. And really, that's all I ask for. Something that's compelling, flaws and all. It's not an enjoyable experience whatsoever, it's an emotionally draining and taxing experience, which kind of makes it a bit hard to recommend, thinking about it. Not everyone wants to play games to experience the whole spectrum of emotion, but that's okay. There are games that I would say invoke feelings beyond that of visceral joy that I can still recommend as games. Resident Evil 2 Remake, for example. Yeah, that game does a pretty good job at scaring me, but it's also a mechanically fun game to play once you're past all the scares. But it's good that games can exist for so many audiences. That's all I got for now. If you like what I do here and want to support the channel monetarily, please consider pledging to my Patreon for unique perks and rewards like these fine folks here. And a special shout out to GAW004 and FarmCat84 for going above and beyond. Otherwise, you can support the Bacon Brigade for free by giving this video a like, subscribing, and hitting the notification icon so you're always up to date on what I'm doing. Elsewise than that, I've been the King of Snark Style right here on Tactical Bacon Productions, and I will see you next time. Peace!